Welcome to our video preview of Catalogue 91 here at Art and Object Important Paintings in Contemporary Art. All the works are currently on display. In just a second, Ben and I are going to talk about some of the works that we find particularly interesting. The auction is this coming Wednesday, the 1st of April at 6.30pm here at 3 Abbey Street in Newton. And we look forward to seeing you in the next couple of days before the auction. I've spent a few days uh, working with the collection, getting it up, getting it uh, hung, and then the open, it was a chance to actually have a good look around. And I think the thing about this particular auction is the surface quality of many of the work. Just looking at this wall beside me, I've got the C-type print of Bill Henson's here, voluptuous, dark and rich. Beside it we've got Stephen Banbury ladder, alchemical, magical in the interaction of uh, resin and graphite through to the magnificent uh, Michael Paracofi powder-coated steel work and then on to the second of the two Shane Cotton works which I'd like to begin by talking about. The first one will be recognisable to many of you as being an example of his uh, increasingly well-known history paintings which he comes up with compositions that feel old. They're sepia-toned, they're brown, a little bit like colonial furniture and most of all they tell stories, they tell tales, they have narratives primarily about the way Māori and Pākehā cultures interacted. And I think the genius of these works is to show the fact that the processes of two cultures interacting are complex and uh, certainly not the one-way street that we're often led to believe. This painting uh, is entitled Kitty Kitty, which I understand uh, Oliver Stead has done the most fantastic essay in the catalogue, which tells us that uh, Kitty Kitty was slang really for the Kitty Kitty region, very close to where the Treaty of Waitangi, of course, was signed. It's grafted on the painterly language of the European uh, surveyors and watercolorists of the time in the form of these linear compositions that feel very geomorphological, the way they cut to the essence of the land, and imposed on them imagery which is really classic Shane Cotton in the form of uh, stenciled letters, words, texts, and then uh, to bring it into the 20th century, this wonderful copyright sign here imposed on the language, and then right down the very bottom, Cotton has signed his name in oversized letters in a way that's uh, wholly engaging and uh, very, very unusual. Many of the early works in this catalogue have direct references. References to societal issues, references to the landscape. But in this work, Tutamara by Michael Parakofi, we see the references are deeply embedded within the conversation around intellectual property and Maori imagery within New Zealand art. This work, of course, is a direct reference of a Gordon Walters work. And in this case, it's a reference to the multiple, the screen print, Tama. And what we're asked to do with this work in this kit set is step into a conversation around authorship within the New Zealand context. It's deeply loaded, it's complicated, but first, I think what we should start with is the wonderful, beguiling, physical presence of what was originally, in its coro form with Gordon Walters, a two-dimensional work, and here it sits as this captivating wall relief. Carrying on with the theme of the quality of surface treatment and the intricacies of paint marking, we transition across this 2013 work from, from 1997. I think we get a lovely insight into the way the artist practice has shifted um, and developed over this period of time. What we have here is a totally different set of painterly concerns. Taking its inspiration, this work, Sky, Land and Words, from the book of Genesis, Cotton here shows how his skill as a painter has developed. We've got this beautiful airbrush surface in the background here, Heavens punctuated by this, I guess, gang patch inspired image which draws our attention directly to the book of Genesis and then through to this, uh, again, in a not dissimilar fashion to Kitty Kitty, this layered landscape superimposed with text across the bottom there. Two very different works which I think taken together show just what a magnificent and important painter Shane Cotton is. This is a work of not of existential crisis but I think of existential uh, realisation and celebration. This is the 1969 canvas by Pat Hadley, Who Am I? With this wonderful, vigorous, Jackson Pollock-esque, if you like, paint application. There's been a lot of debate about whether or not this is in fact a self-portrait of Pat Hadley. Now we can't answer that question conclusively, but the title, of course, gives us a very clear steer in that direction. And the very nature of these molecular works, as they are known from the late 60s and early 70s, really go to the heart of the structure of both the subject matter uh, and the nature of painting itself. And in 
Hanley's own classic style, it really is a joyous piece with free-flowing dribbles and splatters of paint. The molecular works of this period sit at a wonderful transition between the figures in light of the mid-1960s and the later Golden Age works from the 1970s. And what we see in these molecular works is Hanley getting down to the very business, the very essence of pure painting. Colin McCann is an artist who we don't necessarily associate with delicate and beautifully rendered surfaces. But I think these two works here are great examples of, of his skill as both a colourist, but also his skill as a mark maker. They sit together perfectly, obviously because they are punctuated by this rich, uplifting sky blue that features heavily in both. The work on the right, of course, is French Bay, painted in 1956. The work on the left, Colin McCann's Kuiper Flats work from 1971, part of the Kuiper Flats series, looking out over the land this time, you can see the ground here, is rich sort of ochres rendered in oil pastel on a beautiful West Auckland day. The one on the right here, perhaps among the most uh, ebullient, I think, of uh, McCann's French Bay series. Not such a, an overtly cubist composition as many of them. This one punctuated by this crisscrossing here, and uh, no recognisable subject matter, maybe a horizon line here. So uh, I think coming at the end of the French Bay series, and in many ways uh, among the most radical of the Titorangi French Bay paintings. This is one of Michael Shepard's largest works. It's entitled Still Life in the Year of the Comet from 1986. I think what we see in this work is that Shepard operates fabulously at scale. The vast majority of his works, though, are really quite small. But this is a gigantic still life, not just in scale, but in reach in terms of the artist's conceptual inputs. It's set in 1910, in the heart of the Urawera, with the passing of Halley's Comet, which was taken by the followers of the Ringatū Church, Rua Kenana, of course, as a sign of deliverance, a sign of their blessing from Christ, that they, like the Israelites, would be delivered to salvation. And this work by Shepherd is set in the interior of their temple, their tabernacle, Hayona is how they refer to it, which of course is a direct reference to Zion. So in this work, we see, in a 76 year span, which is described by the passing of Halley's Comet, a really key moment in our colonial history, recontextualized some 76 years later in this beautiful still life, which is set in the interior of Hayona.